Hello, Clinic Review family. It's good to see you again. Today, I'm going to be doing fundamentals and focusing on nutrition. Nutrition is my least favorite. I dread getting a nutrition question. So I'm going to go ahead and do it because it's the thing I hate the most. So let's go ahead and cover it. All right. Um, I'm going to, I've got a lot of questions actually to cover as well. So there's some slides where we kind of cover the basics and then we're going to do some questions. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead. I'm trying to center myself here in the picture. All right, let's go ahead and get started. So first of all, you've got to understand that there are only three sources of energy, carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. So they don't get energy from vitamins or minerals. You can have vitamins and minerals in your diet, but they don't give energy. Okay, so carbohydrates are, is the body's favorite source of energy. And they, you can also get fiber in your diet. Fiber helps a lot of things, particularly in the GI tract. So fiber is really good for staying regular. A high fiber diet is protective against colon cancer. Um, and then we have vitamins and minerals. So those are the key things that you find in any diet. So any diet questions are going to be related to one of those things. Now, where can you get carbohydrates? Carbohydrates are in the majority of the foods that we eat. We Americans particularly have very high carbohydrate diets, grains, pasta, milk, fruit, vegetables, also obviously bread, chips, um, all the stuff that we like to eat, donuts, right? All the bread products. So those are all really hard, high in carbohydrates. So it's not hard to find a diet that's high in carbohydrates. And then we have sources of fat. We all know that meat has fat in it. I mean, you can cut off a lot of the meat, but you're still going to have some fat in the meat that you eat. And then there's avocados, cheese, dark chocolate actually has some fat in it. The whole egg. So the white of the egg doesn't have fat in it, but the yellow of the egg does and then nuts and peanut butter. So those are all things that are high in fat. Um, and then we have our proteins and protein is important, obviously, uh, for muscle building and so forth and um, healing. So anytime someone needs to heal from a surgery or heal from say chemotherapy, uh, they need to have more protein in their diet than they would otherwise have. But protein is a large molecule that can be lost in the urine when the is kidney damage. So if someone has kidney damage, whether it's chronic kidney disease or some other kind of kidney damage, we usually encourage them to have lower protein diets. We never say cut out all protein. You need to have protein, uh, but lower protein diets when there's kidney damage. So those are just some, some general principles. Uh, peanuts and peanut butter also have fat and protein. So they're also high in protein, chicken, meat, fish, high in protein, cottage cheese, milk products. These are all high in protein. This is not an exhaustive list. I'm just giving you examples of things that are high in carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. And then fiber is found in green vegetables, fresh fruits. So fresh veggies and fruit, those are really good sources of fiber. Any dried fruits as well. And then potatoes and whole grains also have fiber in them. Um, so those are things, again, remember fiber is good for colon health. So that's something you need to remember. All right. Then we have vitamins and minerals. Um, these are the questions I always hate the most because I'm like, I don't know that much about vitamins and minerals. So you know what the vitamins are, but the, everything is water soluble except for, for fat soluble. So that means if it's water soluble, it means you cannot really overdose on it because it can be lost in the urine. It's the fat soluble vitamins that you can overdose on vitamin A, D, E, and K. And kind of key thing to remember, vitamin A is found in yellow and orange foods and vitamin K, which helps with clotting. Okay. Vitamin K, if you have low vitamin K, you're going to be at risk for bleeding out because vitamin K helps with clotting. Um, and green leafy vegetables and organ meats are high in vitamin K, which is why if someone's taking Coumadin or Warfarin, we tell them to have a consistent diet of vitamin K. We used to tell people cut out all vitamin K. We don't tell people that anymore because they do need to have vitamin K in their diet, but they need to have a consistent amount. Otherwise, it's hard to get that uh, Coumadin or Warfarin level stable in your body if you're constantly having up and down levels of vitamin K in your diet. So we say have a consistent amount of vitamin K in your diet. And then the water soluble, um, all the others, uh, and vitamin C is one that I've seen question ask, questions asked. Those are in citrus fruits. I think most people know that. And then folate or folic acid, um, which is something they could ask about, particularly with pregnancy. 
um, is in green vegetables. So that's where you can find those. And then the minerals, minerals are all the, like we call them electrolytes, but they actually in the, when they're ingested in the diet, we call them minerals and that's potassium, sodium, calcium, magnesium, chloride, and phosphorus. So those are examples of those things that we, you could get questions about potassium, uh, milk, fruit, and vegetables and nuts. So milk, fruits, vegetables, and nuts. And I give you some examples there. Bananas. I think everybody knows potassium is in bananas, oranges, orange juice. So th those are some of the higher uh, sources of uh, potassium, uh, but it's found in all, all fruits and vegetables as well as milk and nuts. And then sodium, um, you have to watch for that in processed and canned foods. So the only questions you're going to get about sodium is when they want you to control the sodium in someone's diet because someone who has heart disease, um, we have to control sodium in their diet. So we always say um, no canned foods, no processed meats, that kind of thing, because those have a lot of um, sodium in them. And then calcium, uh, calcium is good for bone health, and it can be found in milk, spinach, and orange juice. And um, I don't know, did any of you ever watch Popeye the Sailor Man? Popeye was on when I was really quite young, and Pop it was a cartoon, and he used to eat spinach, and it would make his, like his muscles pop out. I don't know if that helps you remember that at all. Uh, magnesium, magnesium uh, and phosphorus are going to be probably going to be questions more related to what do you have to avoid? Uh, because someone who has kidney failure, we're really, with someone who has kidney failure, we're worried about these electrolytes getting out of whack in their body because the, the urine can't excrete them like normal. So Normally, these minerals or electrolytes are excreted in the urine, and when someone's kidneys aren't working, they can build up. So a lot of these things with kidney with kidney diets or renal diets, we're saying you need to cut back on potassium and sodium and calcium and magnesium and phosphorus. Magnesium is found in seeds, nuts, also in spinach. Probably why Popeye got so strong from having spinach because it had all these minerals in it. Um, and then chloride is anything with salt in it because sodium chloride is salt. So anything that would have sodium in it would also have chloride in it. And then phosphorus, dairy, beans, lentils, nuts, oatmeal, cola. Um, there's no great way. I, I can't give you any great way to remember these. Maybe somebody in the comments can say, hey, I remember them this way. For me, I just have to think about it a lot. Like for, I'm, a, I'm an introvert and I process things internally. Some people, extroverts process things verbally. Maybe you have to talk through everything. That probably means you're an extrovert. If you're like me, you have to think through it. That means you're probably an introvert. There's some things that, you know, milk has a lot of good stuff in it. That's why babies can live on milk, right? Milk has fat and protein and carbohydrates, and it's got all these minerals and it's got all these vitamins. So milk has a lot of good stuff in it, but it also has stuff in it that you may want to avoid if you're on a specific diet. So milk is usually a good answer, especially if like for a diabetic, right? Diabetic questions. I like milk has everything in it. It's got, if their blood sugar is low, I like to give them milk because it has everything in it, even better than say orange juice. Like if I, if I had to choose one over the other, I would choose milk over orange juice any day for someone who's hypoglycemic. So someone who needs a nice, well-rounded diet, I'm like, I'm going for the milk option, right? Cause that's got so much good stuff in it. All right, let's talk about some other nutrition considerations. A well-balanced diet includes all, all products, uh, carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. So if they ask you what is a good, healthy diet for someone, yeah, that's not how they're going to word it, but you know, it's, it's clearly they're looking for a well-balanced diet. Um, you want to pick foods that have them all. Uh, milk has them all. The meats have them all. Lean meats particularly, not um, not processed meats, but the, the fresh meats, uh, peanuts and peanut butter, these have all the good stuff in them. That's why I think these are really good options for, for someone who's on, a, on just a regular healthy diet. Now, this may surprise you, but adequate fluid intake is two to 3,000 mils a day. That's two to three liters every day. So anywhere between two and three liters is a good amount. So if we say we want to limit fluids or restrict fluids, by definition, that means less than 2,000 mils a day. And if we're pushing fluids, that means by definition, that's more than 3,000 mils a day. So just realize that two to 3,000 mils a day is adequate, which means if, and we have insensible fluid loss, right? So they're not going to put out two to 3,000 mils of urine, but they're easily putting out 1,200, 1,500, 1,700 mils of urine a day if they're taking an adequate fluid. 
a lot of people don't take inadequate fluid, which is why their urine output is low. But if they're taking inadequate fluid, they're going to have a good amount of urine output. So think about that as you're, as you're reading questions. These are basic principles that every nurse is supposed to know as we're reading questions and interpreting data. Obesity is a body mass index greater than 30. So if they tell you their BMI is 36, you say, okay, this patient's considered obese. Malnutrition is a BMI less than 18. So these are just general principles to think about as you're reading questions. And then labs to determine if someone is malnourished include the prealbumin, albumin, serum protein, BUN. This is interesting. Um, I, you know, I always say the BUN, I look at it if it's high. I care more if the BUN is high. But if my patient is malnourished, their BUN could be quite low. Um, transferrin, which I don't see that often, hemoglobin will be low. Total iron binding capacity will be low. So all these, all these labs, if they're low, we're looking at the possibility of malnutrition. And there really isn't one that we would say, I mean, I would probably say the prealbumin is the most sensitive one there that I'm familiar with. Um, but any of them would be adequate to, to tell you if they're malnourished. It's not super specific, but it'll at least tell you if they're malnourished. All right, let's talk a little bit about special diets. So if someone's on a clear liquid diet, they can have anything that's clear. If you can see through it, even if it has a color to it, if you can see through it, it's part of a clear liquid diet. So broths, tea, coffee. Now you might say, I can't see through my coffee. Well, because you make your coffee very strong, but particularly weaker coffee and weaker tea, they can definitely have. And then any clear fruit juice, so not orange juice, but clear fruit juices they can have. Full liquids then, they can have anything that is um, uh, like a shake um, texture. So they can have shakes, they can have ice cream, they can have supplements like Ensure, they can have custard and pudding, and then and then any, any fruit juice at all, even the not clear ones they can have. Pureed is, and they can have any food on a pureed diet as long as they blend it up and make it pureed, right? So um, any food that can be put in a blender, they can have. They just need to make sure it's blended up so that, you know, there's no, there should be no uh, chewing at all with a pureed diet. And then mechanical soft, these are foods that you do have to chew, but they should be soft. So these are foods, if you're trying to decide what should be on a mechanical soft, you say, well, I need to cut that with a knife. If you would need to cut it with a knife, it's not part of a mechanical soft. Okay, so steak is not going to be on a mechanical soft diet, for example, because you really need to cut that with a knife. So a lot of casseroles, pastas, spaghetti, those are all things that are good, like macaroni and cheese, spaghetti. These are all good things on a mechanical soft diet. Um, so those are some examples of that. And then thickened liquids just means they can have liquids as long as they're using a thickener with it. So a thickener looks a lot like a, like a supplement. Like if you, if you do supplements, powdered supplements, and, or maybe you do different uh, powders, you put them in your water bottle and you take it out of your little packet and you pour it in there, right? And it gives you the, the flavor, or maybe it gives you more protein or something like that as a supplement. That's what the thickeners are, look like. They come in the little packets that you actually rip them open and you put them on in the fluid, in the liquid, and it thickens it up. So it doesn't really add any taste to it. It's not supposed to, but it does thicken it up. So it's easier for them to swallow. Regular diet means no restrictions. No, no restrictions means no restrictions. But if you still, even if they're on a regular diet, you still want to choose answers that are, are healthy, which means you're looking for foods that are lower in sodium, lower in cholesterol, but, but have adequate amounts of fat, adequate amounts of protein and adequate amounts of carbohydrates. So so a regular diet doesn't mean like, doesn't mean, hey, it's great to have like soda and chips. Um, I mean, you can have soda and chips if you want to. I'm just saying as a nurse, that's not what I'm going to recommend. Um, and then a cardiac diet means low sodium, low salt, low cholesterol. So about 300 milligrams a day of cholesterol and no caffeine. And that's because caffeine is an upper and it can get the heart beating faster and can actually um, cause constriction of the vessels so you can have increased blood pressure. So no caffeine for that. And then diabetic is calorie controlled. That's what it is. It doesn't mean they can't have, don't, don't pick a diet that has like no fat in it for a diabetic or no protein or really low carbohydrates. That's not what a diabetic diet is. A diabetic diet is a well-rounded diet, but calorie controlled. Okay. So keep that in mind when you're answering questions about a diabetic diet. And then a renal diet is low sodium, low protein, because it can, the protein molecules can uh, be filtered in the glomerulus and cause more damage. 
low potassium and low phosphorus. So that's a renal diet. And then a gluten-free is no wheat, no oats, no rye, no barley, or their derivatives. So that's why it's usually like bread products that they're limited in. So if you're on a gluten-free diet, a lot of times you have to buy special breads um, and different, um, different products like that. All right. If you're going to give feeding assistance, someone has problems with eating or you're simply just assisting them. Maybe they have a stroke, have had a stroke, but they're, they're cleared to eat. They've had a swallowing evaluation. They're cleared to eat. Um, but you're going to be feeding them. The key thing to remember is they need to be between 30 and 45 degrees up. So never head of the bed flat and keep the chin down. So that doesn't mean I have to be like this. Okay. That's not what I'm talking about. But, you know, don't stand up like, don't stand above them and feed them so they have to lift their, their head up like that. You want to help them. You're, you should be coming in from this direction to eat. And, you know, it's really interesting because we tend to eat like this anyway, don't we? We keep our food down here and we, we do like this. So we keep our chins down anyway. Um, and that's actually the best way to prevent um, choking or coughing or gagging. And then you need to know these terms, enteral versus parenteral. Enteral is anything that goes in through the GI tract. So it could be eaten, that's enteral, but it can also go through an NG tube because that's going into the GI tract. And it can also be going through a PEG tube or a J tube because these are all going through the GI tract. So if someone has a functional GI tract, uh, they may have had um, some kind of cancer that they can't, they can't swallow anymore, but their GI tract is still functional. They may get a peg tube. That's still an enteral nutrition. And then parenteral is through an IV. Okay. So those are key things to remember when you get questions about enteral or parenteral nutrition. Now for an NG tube, if they get an NG tube placed, it has to be checked with an x-ray the first time. Do not use it until it's been checked with an x-ray. And then after that, you have to confirm it with pH reading. Don't choose the answer where it says you put in, insert an air bubble to check for placement. That is no longer how we're checking them. Okay. And, and if that's what you're doing at your hospital, that's up to you. I'm telling you, uh, evidence-based practice is you check it with a pH and the pH should be under six. So if it's over six, you need to recheck the placement with an x-ray and they need to have mouth care every two hours and the tube feeding if they're getting continuous tube feeding or even intermittent tube feeding, you always check for residual, right? You go in, you, if it's intermittent tube feeding and you're pouring it in, um, before you pour it in, you check for residual. And if it's a continuous tube feeding, then you're checking for residual every four to six hours. So you stop the tube feeding and you draw back to see how much residual is in there. And if the residual is less than 250 mils, you can continue with the feeding. Or if it's greater than 250 mils, you have to hold the tube feeding. Okay, you would you would hold the two feeding, and if there's orders um, to you know how long. Sometimes there's standing orders to hold it this long and then turn it back on, um, or you know it may say hold the two feeding and call the doctor. That's fine too, um, whichever. And then if they're if you start two feeding, so the thing is they're starting on a liquid diet, right? And it often causes diarrhea, which is why we started out slow and increase it gradually. Usually we try to get it up to its. Um, goal rate within 24 hours. And so you start it slow and you increase it gradually to get it up to its goal rate. If you start it and they have diarrhea, you turn it down. So you try to start it slow enough that they don't have any symptoms of diarrhea. And then you slowly increase the rate till their body kind of starts to adjust to that. All right. TPN, parenteral nutrition is IV nutrition, and it always goes in a central line. Never choose to give it in a pick line. Never choose to give it in a, um, in a peripheral line of any kind. Okay. It always goes through a central venous catheter and you have to monitor the blood glucose. Uh, even if they're not eating any other meals, maybe it's all their, all their calories are coming in through the TPN. Um, you're still checking blood sugar every six hours. And when it's time to turn it off, you taper it off. You never just stop it abruptly, you have to taper it down. So let's say it's running at 75 mils an hour. You're going to turn it down to 50 and then to 25 until you turn it off. And if it's abruptly stopped, um, something happens, it gets pulled out, you lose the central line, something happens, you have to hang D50 
um, uh, so that they are not abruptly stopped. So you hang D50 for uh, several hours and wean that off um, so that it's not abruptly stopped. You should really expect to get questions with the words enteral or enteral and parenteral. Those are words you should expect to see on your NCLEX. So you need to know what they mean. All right, let's do some questions. Let me make this a little bigger. Some people who watch this on their phone tell me that it's sometimes it's too small. So the nurse is discussing dietary concerns with pregnant teens. Which choices are convenient for teens yet nutritious for both the mother and the fetus? Select all that apply. So let's read through the answers first. Milkshake or yogurt with fresh fruit or granola bar. Chicken nuggets with tater tots. Cheese pizza with spinach and mushroom topping. Peanut butter with crackers and a juice drink. Buttery light popcorn with Diet Cola or cheeseburger pickle and ketchup. So let's just select all that apply. So what's the key words here? The key words are nutritious. Nutritious. Convenient for teens, but nutritious. So this is pregnant women have no special diet. This, this, we are looking, this is a regular diet. We're looking for foods that have uh, carbohydrates, proteins, and fats, none of which should be extreme, like fats and proteins don't need to be super high, but we don't want it to be all carbs. And it has to have some calories in it because you only get calories um, with carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. And we want it to be nutritious. Nutritious means well-rounded. All right, first one, milkshake or yogurt with fresh fruit or granola bar. Well, gosh, I like that. Remember I told you milk has like all the stuff they need, right? Milkshake or yogurt has all the stuff they need. Then you get fresh fruits, got lots of vitamins and minerals in it. Granola has a little bit of fat as well and protein and it makes it taste good. So that looks like a really good option. Okay, so it looks good. Number two, chicken nuggets with tater tots. So we've got chicken and potatoes, but both of them are fried. So I am not going to pick that because chicken is good. If it said fresh uh, chicken or grilled chicken with a baked potato, I would pick it, but not chicken nuggets with tater tots because they're fried. Now, do I think a teenager is going to eat chicken nuggets with tater tots? I do think they're going to eat it, but I'm not going to recommend it. Do you understand that? They're asking what I would recommend. Okay. Um, or it doesn't say that, but the, we're discussing dietary concerns. So which choices are convenient yet nutritious? So I'm not going to say, oh yeah, that's a good idea. Right. And so anyway, I'm not going to pick number two, number three, cheese pizza. So we've got cheese. Cheese has a lot of good stuff and it's got fats, proteins, and carbohydrates in cheese. And then you got the pizza. So you got the bread, which is fine. Spinach and mushrooms. We've got vegetables, uh, topping. So this is actually a nutritious option. It's not fried. There's not high fat that I can tell. Um, it looks like it's well-rounded. So I, I like that option. I'm going to go ahead and pick it. Number four, peanut butter. Peanut butter is great. Remember nuts are great. They got lots of good stuff in them. Crackers, you've got your carbohydrates and a juice drink. Okay. That seems fine. And remember, what do we always give patients, at least in Ohio, what do we always give patients when they say, I'm hungry, can I have a snack? Like it's 10 o'clock at night. I'm hungry, can I have a snack? What do we always give them? We always give them Crackers and juice with peanut butter. Isn't that what we always give them? Because that's what we have at 10 o'clock at night on the floor. Now, some of you work hospitals where you probably got, I'm like, you're like, we got all kinds of good stuff at our place. Well, that's, you know, I wish I worked where you did because when the places I've worked, all we have is peanut butters and crackers with juice. So that's why we give that because it's well-rounded. It's relatively nutritious. So that's a good option. Number four, number five, buttery light popcorn with diet cola. So there's nothing particularly wrong with buttery light popcorn and diet cola but they're empty calories. Have you heard that phrase, empty calories? So that's sort of a, re that, that phrase doesn't really make sense. Empty, can't have empty calories. Either you have calories or you don't. What we're talking about here is really empty food. These are foods that have no nutritional value to them. And since we're asking about nutritious foods, I'm not gonna recommend buttery light popcorn with Diet Cola. So very few calories, not a lot there to help her and her baby with growth. And then number six, cheeseburger. I don't mind the cheeseburger. We've got meat and cheese. That's fine. But then we've got pickle and ketchup. And pickle and ketchup are very high in sodium. And so I'm not going to recommend that just because these are high sodium foods. And generally, uh, particularly for, for pregnant women who are more prone to edema in their ankles and so forth, I'm not going to recommend that. So I think number one, number three, and number four are good options. And so those are the options I'm going to pick.
Second question, the nurse is evaluating the recent lab results for a patient. Which labs are the best indicators for malnutrition? So we don't, this is a pretty standard lab question. We're not, we don't, we're not told what the patient's problem is. We're not told anything about the patient. It's just which labs indicate malnutrition. And so either you know it or you don't. So serum total protein, yes. Pro, total protein gives an idea because as if they're malnourished, serum total protein goes down. Potassium, no. Uh, lipids, no. Albumin, yes. Albumin is also a protein. It's a serum protein and that goes down. And then serum BUN also goes down. It's a nitrogen balance thing when people are malnourished. It's actually a nitrogen balance and it has a lot to do with protein as well. So um, one, four, and five are the correct answers with this one. The nurse is caring for a client with dysphagia, which is difficulty swallowing, and is feeding her a puree diet when she begins to choke. What is the priority nursing intervention? So I think of a person, I'm picturing it in my head. She's got dysphagia, so she's trouble eating. She starts to choke. So I'm thinking, okay, obviously I stopped feeding her and I make, maybe I put her head up a little bit more. Maybe I put her on the back a little bit. Maybe I have her put her chin down. Those are the things I'm thinking of as I think about this. So let's read the answers and see what's there. Suction her mouth and throat. Okay. Well, I have never done that before when someone was choking, uh, turn her on her side, maybe if I think she's going to throw up, but I don't know why I would do that. Put on oxygen at two liters. No, that's not what I do. I don't know what a row two set is. Stop feeding her. Well, I have to stop feeding her. Obviously, I have to stop feeding her. So do you know why I put this question on here? I put this question on here because it's almost too easy. And it's easy to go, well, it can't be that. It can't be just stop feeding her. Yep, it is. That's actually the right answer. None of the other things are things we do, right? We just stop feeding someone. We let them kind of cough and work it out. And I kind of standing there watching them, making sure they're breathing and their skin looks okay. And maybe I haven't put their, their chin down a little bit and maybe I put the head up a little bit, but none of those options are there. The only thing that I do that's there is stop feeding her. So I got to pick it. A patient is receiving both parenteral and enteral nutrition. When would the nurse collaborate with a healthcare provider and request a discontinuation of parenteral nutrition? Okay, so this is someone, well, I don't. I, it doesn't tell me what the problem is. Why would they be getting both? Um, they might be getting both because they've been on TPN and they're, they're starting the enteral nutrition and um, eventually we'll get that TPN discontinued probably is why they're on that. So when are we going to ask for discontinuation of the parenteral? So you can only really get this right if you know what parenteral versus enteral is because it never tells you which one is which ever in this question. So you have to know which one is which. So I'm going to ask for discontinuation of the TPN when 25% of the patient's nutritional needs are met by the tube feedings. That doesn't seem like very much. Like 25% of the tube nutritional needs, it seems like that wouldn't be time yet to turn off the TPN. When the bowel sounds return, well, no, they should... The bowel sounds should have returned a long time ago if they're on enteral nutrition. When the central line has been in for 10 days, that's not, that's a random number. That's not a number that has any meaning with how long a central line can be in. When 75% of the patient's nutritional needs are met by the tube feedings. Well, that seems like a good idea. If 75% of the patient's nutritional needs are now being met by the tube feedings, it seems like it would be time to turn off the TPN. So I'm going to pick that one. So I want you to I want you to see that you're going to be using your common sense quite a bit with these um, these questions. You have to know some basic facts. You got to know vocabulary. You've got to know you know the basic components of what gives energy to the body. Have some basic knowledge about vitamins and minerals. Um, how do we prevent choking and so forth? But a lot of this is just common sense. A client is receiving enteral feeding at 65 mils an hour. The gastric residual is in in four hours was 125. What's the priority nursing intervention? So what was the number we said you stop feeding at or you stop the tube feeding? You stop it if it's greater than 250. So it's 125. So I can keep going with the tube feeding. Don't let, don't get scared and say, well, I don't know, maybe that's too much. It's not. 250 is the cutoff number. So what's the priority nursing intervention? Assess the bowel sounds, raise the head of the bed, continue the feedings. This is normal gastric residual. 
or hold the feeding until you talk to the healthcare provider. Okay, don't get scared and think, oh, maybe I should at least assess the bowel sounds. No, it's fine. It's totally fine. Uh, we're just going to continue with the tubings. This is uh, two feedings. This is a normal gastric residual. The nurse is conducting a health history for a client at risk for cancer, which lifestyle factors considered a risk for colorectal cancer. So it doesn't look like a nutrition question until you start reading the answers and you go, okay, these are almost all nutritional things. Conducting a health history for a client at risk for cancer, which lifestyle factors considered a risk for colorectal, a diet low in vitamin C, a high dietary intake of artificial sweeteners, a high fat, low fiber diet, or multiple sexual partners. So um, there's a, a rule that a guessing strategy that sometimes we tell people to use if you're purely, purely guessing, we call it the Sesame Street rule. And we say, which one of these is not like the others, which one just doesn't belong, which means you pick the answer that has nothing, that's nothing at all like the other answers. And some people say, oh, that works a lot. It does work a lot, actually. The Sesame Street rule look works a lot when you pick an answer that's nothing like the others, but it only works well when you're purely guessing, because if you were to use the Sesame Street rule here, you would pick number four because one, two, and three are all dietary options and four has nothing to do with diet, but you'd get it wrong if you use the Sesame Street rule here. So don't ever use the Sesame Street rule unless you are purely, purely guessing. If you know the answer, you have to answer it based on what you know. And we know that high fat, low fiber is a risk factor for colorectal cancer. We know fiber is protective of the colon. So if you can hear my dog in the background ripping paper apart. So it's important to have high fiber for colon, colon health. So we're going to pick that and that's the right answer. A 42-year-old is interested in making dietary changes to reduce the risk of colon cancer. Another colon cancer question. What dietary selection should the nurse suggest? All right. So colon cancer. So we know, and the, I put this after the last question on, on purpose because I wanted to make sure that you know this is the same question, only do you know which foods are high in fat and low in fiber? So we want to pick foods that are lower in fat and higher in fiber. Okay. So number one, a croissant, that's bread, but not, not a, a grain, like a, a wheat product. Wheat products are the ones that have fiber in them and it's not granola and peanut butter squares. So peanut butter has, and granola both have quite a bit of fat in them and whole milk has quite a bit of fat. So there's nothing wrong with croissant, granola, peanut butter squares, and whole milk, but it's a high, it's a high fat options. And I don't really want to pick the high fat options here. Brand muffin, okay, that's high in fiber. Skim milk, that's lower in fat, but you still get all the other good stuff that comes in milk. And stir fry broccoli, again, low fat and vegetables and fruits are high in fiber. So two is a good fiber, high fiber, low fat option. Three, granola, again, pretty high in fat. Bagel with cream cheese, again, white bread stuff. Croissant and bagel, these are white breads. These don't have high fiber. Cream cheese has fat in it, cauliflower salad. Yeah, the only, I mean, that's fine, but that doesn't make up for the granola and the bagel. And number four, oatmeal raisin cookies. Okay, cookies, it's going to have, you know, it's okay, but it's not going to be high in fiber. Baked potato with sour cream. Okay, nothing wrong with that. Turkey sandwich. So four is not bad. Um, sour cream has fat in it. Um, the cookies probably have some fat in it. There's not, so for me, it's between two and four. And I go, well, there's not really too much wrong with number four, but it's not nearly as good as number two. Number two is clearly high fiber, low fat. So I'm going to pick number two. And this right here, this kind of question right here is why I don't love nutrition questions. Cause I'm like, ooh, ooh, ooh. I don't know. Maybe I think I know the right answer. Using a sliding scale schedule, the nurse is preparing to administer an evening dose of regular insulin to a client who's receiving TPN. So remember I told you, you check, even if they're not a diabetic, you're checking blood sugars of the patient who's on TPN because we need to make sure that they're tolerating all the carbohydrates that they're getting in through that TPN. 
So we're checking it every six hours, four to six hours, a lot of times every six. Uh, so they're getting ready to give the insulin and on which information should the nurse base the dosage. Now we're giving regular insulin. And if you watch the diabetic video that I put out a week or so ago, you know that regular insulin peaks in two hours. Its onset is one hour. So the number one is the glucometer reading of the client's glucose level obtained immediately before administering the insulin. That sounds like a good option. Number two, a fasting blood glucose level obtained earlier in the day. That's impossible. They can't do a fasting blood glucose when they're on continuous TPN. Three, the amount of TPN fluid the client has received since the last dose of insulin. No, we don't base insulin doses on the amount of TPN they've gotten. We give insulin based on blood sugars. And number four, the client's dietary intake for the evening meal and snack. No, that's not how we give insulin. We give it based on blood sugars. So I'm going to have to do number one. You, you check the blood sugar every six hours. You give insulin based on the blood sugar that, that it is. A client who experiences angina has been told to follow a low cholesterol diet. Which meal would be best? All right. Cholesterol. I talked about fat. I didn't talk a lot about cholesterol. Um, eggs and organ meats are highest in cholesterol. There's other foods that are high in fat, but actual, see, cholesterol is typically made in the body. We don't eat a lot of cholesterol. Um, cholesterol is made in the, I think it's in the liver. So the different fatty acids go to the liver and is made, um, into cholesterol. But if you want to decrease the amount of cholesterol you intake, actual cholesterol, you have to decrease eggs and organ meats. So they've been told to follow low cholesterol. So we're looking for low cholesterol. One, which meal would be best? Hamburger, salad, and milkshake. That doesn't have a lot of cholesterol in it. Two, bake liver, green beans and coffee at, nope. Spaghetti with tomato sauce, salad, and I see, oh, I like that one. That's really low cholesterol. Four, fried chicken, beans, milk, and skim milk. So I don't like four because it's fried chicken and you take in if you take in a lot of fat, then it's more likely to go to the liver and be made into cholesterol. So low cholesterol is going to be both low cholesterol, which means no organ meats and low eggs and low fat. So I'm crossing out four because that's too much fat. I'm crossing off number two because that's an organ meat that actually has liver in it. So now I got to choose between a hamburger, which is higher in fat, salad and milkshake, which also has fat in it versus spaghetti and tomato sauce. There's not really any fat in those that I know of. Salad, no fat, iced tea, no fat. So three is the one that is the best option here. So that's, I'm going to pick that one. All right. A client with acute renal failure asked the nurse for a snack because the client's potassium level is elevated, which snack is most appropriate? Well, definitely not a banana. Banana's out. So a gelatin dessert, yogurt, and orange or peanuts. Okay, remember I told you that um, uh, potassium is in, let's see, we talked about fruits, particularly bananas and oranges. So I'm going to get rid of the orange. And then we said it was also in milk and nuts. Do you remember the, <laughs> saying that? So I got to cross off yogurt and peanuts. And a gelatin dessert, if you don't know what a gelatin dessert is, that's the NCLEX word for jello. That's why we got jello on the on your unit. Check your unit's refrigerator. There's a ton of jello in there because it's got nothing bad in it, really. You can have it. Um, doesn't have a lot of good stuff in it, but it doesn't have anything bad. So out of these options, if I have to choose one of these, um, I, have, I can think of some things I'd rather give her, but out of these options... A gelatin dessert is the best option. Jello. The nurse is instructing the client with chronic renal failure to maintain adequate nutrition. Which diet would be most appropriate? All right. So renal. So kidney failure. So they're having trouble getting rid of minerals like electrolytes. So I don't want them to take in too many electrolytes. And I don't want them to have a ton of protein. They really need to be low protein. So let's see what we've got here. Oh, I thought they're going to give me foods. All right. High carbohydrate, high protein. All right. I'm crossing it off because it says high protein. Two, high calcium, high potassium, high protein. Well, no, absolutely not. Three, low protein. Good. Low sodium. Good. Low potassium. Good. Four, low protein. Fine. High potassium. No. 
So the only one that is okay is low protein, low sodium, low potassium. Because those are the things that, that they're going to struggle with. Okay, I hope that helped you. Um, Y'all, fundamentals is critical for passing NCLEX. You absolutely have to know the fundamentals. Um, there have been some changes to the clinic reviews, and we are now starting in the next few weeks. I don't know when exactly the date is. We're going to be starting with uh, selling the actual clinic review lectures online. I will be putting out a video here in a little while with some more details about that. I already put out a short video on that. So if you haven't watched our shorts, go ahead and watch that. You can find a link with more information on it. Otherwise, um, I hope you have a great rest of your day. Good luck on next gen. I will put out more next gen case studies and I hope you have a great day.